Hello everybody and welcome to a hobby cheating video. Uh, this one's going to be a little unusual as we're not going to be painting anything. Instead, this one is all about color theory. And specifically I want to talk about color theory and its application to models. There's a lot of good videos out there on color theory and I'll, I'll link a few down below um, that'll walk you through sort of the basics of what I'm going to talk about here in the beginning in more detail. Um, but I don't really want to, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. My problem with a lot of them is they don't really connect with then applying those theories when it comes to miniatures and how you're going to apply paint and color to the miniature. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, but first we're going to lay some groundwork. And so here on our first slide we see just some basic terms that we're going to be talking about uh, and some basic concepts. So first of all, color terms, right? We can ignore hue. Hue is just another word for color. It's fine. Um, saturation is how bright, strong that color is. In general, we don't have to worry too much about saturation when we're miniature painting uh, because it's not as easy to control the saturation. Where that's It's more for a digital medium. What we tend to control instead is shade and tint, right? So shade is... If you take this standard color, let's say red, and you start mixing in black, it gets more shaded. The darker it gets, that's the shades of red. Tint is applying more white, so moving it up. Uh, and so both of those directions, we tend to think of it in terms of highlighting and shading. Um, but when we say highlighting, even though we don't always use white paint to, to do it, Effectively, what it is is, of course, it's, it's controlling the tint of the color, okay? Um, saturation more comes about when you work in very thin glazes and stuff like that, and how much you saturate that color over what's underneath it. Um, for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to talk too much about saturation, just because that's, that's more for a video about glazing and something like that. We're going to talk mainly about using the different colors together and shading them and tinting them and stuff like that. Uh, and then, of course, so when we talk about colors, there's a little color psychology thing here. And I think this is very useful. That's why I like this slide. Red is, you know, obviously it's a hot color. It's exciting. It's bright. It's, you know, when, when you, there, there's sort, sort of agitation and anger and all of those things that get communicated. There's a reason why gods like corn get red models and things, right? Because it has energy to it. Um, blue is cool and calm and collected. It's a cold color, right? And so, as, as it says here, conjures up cleanliness, knowledge, precision, things like that. So when you think of blue and, you know, you think of, like, Zinch or something like that, right? I think the Chaos Gods are interesting. They're, they're interesting um, in how they use color to, to represent what they are. I don't think it's accidental that they ended up in the colors they did, um, even if it was subconscious in its original choice. Um, yellow, it says here with leisure and kids products. The funny thing about yellow is in general, it's awful. Um, and by that, I simply mean yellow is a really out there color. It's so bright. It's so hard to use correctly. It's hard to paint. Um, it's one of the more challenging colors simply that, uh, that you can put down in a miniature. Um, I have a lot of colors of blue. Like I'm looking at my blue paints right now and I've probably got, I probably have 30 different blue paints. Um, I have maybe eight yellows. Or even, and that's probably overshooting, um, just because it just it doesn't get used a lot. Um, and then finally, green. And green is a super important color for miniature painting, even though it's not a primary color, it's a secondary color, it's a combination of blue and yellow. Um, I think it's probably the next most important color. When you're talking about like four whatever TVs, they you know obviously have green as their other color there. Um, and, and the reason that I think green is so valuable is exactly what it says here. It's associated with the environment and nature. When you want earthy tones and things like that, you want green. So right off at the beginning, my point with this slide is to tell you that the colors you choose communicate the feeling that you're imparting to the viewer of the miniature. Okay? So if I took a bunch of corn models and painted them in blues and pinks, it would feel strange to the viewer who knew something about corn to anybody randomly on the street. It wouldn't necessarily mean anything, but they would not get a feeling of like murder and energy and anger, right? Because that's just not what those colors would communicate. 
if I painted them in greens and browns and earth tones, the army would suddenly feel much more nature-driven. Again, these would be weird choices for a reason. Now you can play in this space, but my point is, is that what colors you choose are impactful and mean something to the viewer. Okay? All right, next up. Color schemes. So this is probably the most commonly thought of thing when we talk about color theory with miniatures is what, how are you using your color scheme? And there's a lot of different ways you can combine colors around the color wheel, okay? Um, the most obvious that always gets appealed to is complementary colors or, or what are often said, you know, to, to contrast. Complementary colors contrast the most. In this example, it's orange and blue. I think those are out, honestly the two least used um, uh, complementary colors. It's hilarious they picked that. Um, the, the easy example there would have been red and green, by the way, um, because you see it every Christmas. And that's why people have come to like that. It combines the, these two interesting contrasting colors that are visually appealing to the eye, and so hence red and green. Uh, another very popular one you often see in comics and the like is purple and green. Um, and so like when you think of villain colors, like Lex Luthor's uh, Legion of Doom outfit, right? It's all purple and green. Uh, so, you know, the, the use of complementary colors can be very valuable. It can also be very stark. Um, so when you use those opposite colors, like pause for a moment and conjure in your head the image of something orange and blue. It's probably not immediately appealing to you. Because if they're not put in very, very excellent balance, um, and generally that means either something like 50-50 or like 95-5, okay? That is to say, either will work. Either orange is sort of this rare highlight to a largely blue model, like say some flames scattered around on a largely blue model, that's okay. Or they're held in almost complete balance. We're gonna see an example of that later then it looks weird. So more often, actually, people tend to go for like triadic color schemes, which is anything that contains three, uh, really. Uh, the triadic one here, their example, is like the exact triangle, but I would honestly count like the analogous color thing and the split complement on the right side of the page to be similar three color schemes. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show all of these in use. What I would immediately say you probably want to stay away from when it comes to miniatures is any of the the tetradic or, you know, the, the four color schemes. Um, like four distinct colors, especially the square color scheme, where you are in four completely different colors. On a small miniature, that's just more often than not going to be too busy, okay? The advantage to something like the split complement, which I think is honestly one of the better ways to go, um, I would say the most common ones I work in are split complement and analogous, um, is because those uh, have a comfort level to them in that you, you have multiples of your colors crushed together into sort of the same base color. And the way we mix paints isn't obviously to use just, you know, one color straight and then another color straight. Because we can blend our paints, those two can sort of bleed into each other, right? And so we have this luxury to be able to to sort of create uh, low tones and high tones of those other colors uh, it, together, which creates this uh, harmony amongst the model. All right, so moving on. Let's, let's, enough, like, I've got one more thing for you, but then let's get into some reality. So this is out of Adobe. And when you look at these, I want you to really look, because these are some uh, color themes that are out of Adobe that are sort of, you know, kind of preset or whatever. And they're interesting in what they allow. So when you look at the top and you look at that Jade 1, what you've got there is effectively a green with various tints and shades running off of it, right? And it's all green. That is to say, it goes from a very, very dark green up to a very minty light green. Um, but it's still a very comfortable series of tones, and you can see they all work well together. The second one is your complementary color in action, right? We've got that orange and blue there. 
And when you look at these, I think this is a really interesting little palette because it shows how some of them are immediately appealing to the eye and some of them really are not when you think of like how this would work on a miniature. Uh, and, and I think that this is something that when you look at it, you look down at like in the lower right when you see the purple and gold. That looks, I think, quite appealing. Um, but moving to the left, just one where you have like the orangey reds and the purpley reds together, I think is honestly fairly offensive to the eye. Um, it's, it's just sort of very garish, right? Okay. So let's talk about models. Oh, wait, we didn't mean this type of models. Sorry. Uh, but no, I think this is very useful. Uh, let's apply some of this color theory to models. So this is like some model, I guess like a recent fashion show. I don't know. I pulled it off the internet. But I, I love it for the purposes of what it does with color. Okay. So when you first look at this, th this lady here is wearing two extremely bright contrasting sort of colors with this blue and pink. And um, what I love about it is witness the way that the designer has balanced out the color. And, you know, a lot of this might seem just silly or foofy, but all of this, I think, is very intentional. When you look at the blue and the way it is, it creates a triangle going straight down to the tip of her feet, from her shoulders to her feet. She's a triangle, right? So we have the blue across her top, and the arrow is even pointing down with that little jangly dangly thing over her pink skirt. The belt has the blue in it, the little jangly, I don't know, it looks like a pom-pom shredded thing is blue, and then her leggings and shoes are, have the blue in them, right? And all that creates a triangle. At the same time, look at the opposite triangle of the pink. The dress flares out and creates an upward triangle, right? Up to her lips, which are in that same color pink. And so what we've got is two triangles sitting against each other. We're going to see another example of this later in miniatures. But this is a great example of both directionality and color balance. Uh, this is the kind of thing you want to create on your miniature because it creates good movement over, uh, over from by the viewer's eye and also balances out the color. Okay, now let's talk about real models. All right, so first up are, and I'm going to use some of my models mostly just because I, I don't want to use a bunch of other people's models that aren't mine, um, but I'm going to, but I'll, but I'll use mostly my stuff. That's not in any way me saying I'm a master of this. It is simply the easiest thing to do. Okay, so this is a fairly monochromatic color scheme, both of these, right? Um, they're mainly in purple, like the, the guy on the right is in purple, the guys on the left are in blue. And we're playing completely with shades and tints. And it's a, to me, it's a good example of how you can get away with working almost primarily in one real color because I have pushed the contrast so high uh, on a lot of this color. Like I go all the way up to white and I come all the way down to black, more or less, in both of these, letting the color then go throughout. And because of that, you get what I think is, I think these guys are both fairly visually interesting models, while at the same time using what's basically one core color, right? Um, now what I'll note about this is when I say that you might look and go, well, yeah, there's other colors there though. There's white and, and gray and gold, and that's true. But this discussion is going to largely ignore all of those. And the reason for that is because your eye already ignored all of those. Um, White is a fairly bright color and, you know, can get picked up on some, but when you get especially to the darker neutral tones, browns, grays, blacks, you just don't see them. Like your eye just doesn't notice them. They just fade into the background and you tend to not even notice that they're there. Um, for example, I could ask you what color are these guys' belts? And you would probably have to stop and look. I mean, the answer is darker gray. And it's not because they're not in frame. They're all three belts you can see clearly enough. It's just they fall into the back. They, they just sort of fall into nothing. They're not really in, highly visible. Okay. Because of that gray monotone nature to it. So I think the key is when you want to keep it down to sort of one color, you can do that. 
one main actual color. Uh, and when we say color, again, think of the color wheel, which doesn't have white or black on it, nor metallics. Um, the, the key with that is to then really think about your tints and your shades, about pushing your contrast, your highlights and your lowlights, because you can create visually interesting things. And also, these are almost, like, by their very nature, they're balanced. I don't have to worry as much about balancing out the miniature. All right, let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about analogous color schemes. So things that are all just basically around the wheel together. And that is this guy. Um, fire is the most common analogous color scheme I think most people experiment with. Because it effectively uses yellow, orange, red, and then shades and tints of those, especially shades of red and tints of yellow, right? So this is a Fire Phoenix I did for, for Tom, and I, I love this miniature. Um, I was very happy with how he came out. And it, I think he creates the, the hotness pretty well of, of what fire should look like. But it's a good example of how you can use analogous colors to create the contrast that I just talked about in the last one, right? So in the last image, I used basically one color to create a wide sweeping feeling of high, bright, white to dark. Here, I'm going through a couple different colors to achieve it, but I'm doing the same thing. Because these are all analogous, I'm going from basically an extremely, extremely deep, almost blackened, charred red, um, the very tips of their that that guy's wings are they look black but they're not even the very tips are still have actually some red brown in them um, all the way into obviously what is actually legitimately pure white in a very thin line um, and I'm using an analogous color pattern to facilitate that transition so fire is one that and it, also this is a thing people see right there's something to be said for the color pattern that you walk through existing in nature. Because fire is a thing and people see fire, they, whether it, like, I, admittedly they don't see fire phoenixes, but they see fire or volcanoes or whatever, it's not shocking to the eye, your brain sort of naturally tends to accept that these colors work out okay together. Both because they are adjacent to each other on the color wheel and it's comfortable, but also because it harkens to the viewer's existing experiences. All right. Next up. So this is a Chaos Lord from Flame On Miniatures. This, this was not done by me, I want to be very clear. This is done by an extremely talented painter um, from Flame On Miniatures. I believe he actually recently sold this on eBay um, for like $500. <laughs> so, which I think it is worth every penny of, by the way. Um, I can't even begin to imagine how many hours he put in to do this. Um, this is a great example of the sort of hot and cold. People, when they look at this, obviously it's hot and cold. You've got ice crystals on the bottom. You've got fire on the top, up in his, between his horns and in his weapon. And these are obviously very contrasting colors. Here is that orange and blue, right? And when you really look at this, that's what's going on. The top of him is orange, the bottom of him is blue. Now, there are just hundreds of shades and tints of both going on, and he's using, as we just said, he's using an analogous color uh, complementary scheme, right? Because the top is using yellow, orange, red, and the bottom is using uh, still mainly a couple shades of blue, but it's not all one shade of blue. If you look at the tip of his fingers and his kneecap and at the end of his arm plate, you can see that that goes up into a more sky blue type of thing and, and so on and so forth. There's some deeper colors in there as well as playing with shades and tints. Um, but the reason this works, I think, in addition to being just an absolute masterpiece, um, is because his balance is so perfect in the way that he achieved a very, it's not exactly proportional, but it's enough of the bright orange on top versus the blue on the bottom. You can see what's going on with the piece. The miniature itself tends to balance out. If you take the base out of it, it's a pretty 50-50 miniature, right? And the base stands aside because you added a bunch more white. 
Like when you look at that base, because it's ice, there's a lot more white, which actually serves to balance out some of the extremely brighter tones and the high yellows at the top. So often when you, this, this is my, my point with this figure is a couple things. One, to show this amazing miniature and you know to direct you to go see Flame On's site if you want to look at a bunch more amazing stuff he's done. Um, but also to point out that these uh, complementary colors when used to contrast each other work well when they're in good balance, right? And you can still, you can kind of combine that sort of analogous color scheme, right? With the complementary colors on the other side to create a, a, an even richer palette of contrast. All right, this is from, of course, our old friend Victor Case. And uh, this has got to be one of my favorite figs he's ever done. And I want to talk about this because I find it very interesting. It's such a magnificent, balanced piece. And uh, it's, it's just really wonderful in, in how it looks. So what's great about Victor's army, his whole army, is that the way he uses his purple... Um, because the purple on this is the other side of the cloak. And there might be a couple angles of this where it's not perfectly in balance. But for the most part, when you hold the miniature and look at it, it's so perfect how he's created the triangle of the purple between what's over his shoulders down to the sort of barding of the Dracoth versus the green, which goes upward off of the armor plates of the shoulders and legs of the Dracoth up to the flag. And I love that he did the flag. The, the little piece of genius here to me, not that there's not an amazing amount of good work here, but the little piece of genius to me is that he made the flag green primary and white as the lettering. Imagine for a moment, flip that in your mind and make it white with the green. The green would be less balanced, right? Because there would be so much less of it at the top of the miniature. It would all be weighted toward the bottom, especially because he's got the big white fade on the cloak, okay? But because he switched the lettering, like he went opposite of how I think, how I would have thought to do it, certainly, he created this intense balance where there's enough of the green up top to weight against it. Now, to be completely fair, this is actually a sort of uh, split complementary because he's also using the blue, right? He's got the electric blue sort of scattered around and hinted at in the scales of the Dracoth uh, and even in some of the flesh tone of the Dracoth, right? And certainly up on the energy and runes and such of the weapon. So he's used that tertiary color very sparingly, which is a good, uh, which is a very good lesson. In general, your fig should be, basically, if you're going to have, when we're talking colors, again, let's return to true colors. Not whites, not blacks, not browns, not metallics. Colors. Uh, hues, right? When we're talking about those kinds of hues, in general, your fig should be two. Now, I don't mean there should only be two colors on there and that you shouldn't have shades and tints and that you can't use a tertiary color. But when you bring in that third color, it's best as a minor touch, as a highlight, as something used to sort of create visual interest amongst the balance of the other two. And it still needs to be brought into balance, which you can see he's done very well here. Look at the energy at the top of the hammer. Follow it on a line straight down. Look at the scales on the front left leg, and then trace that back to the scales on the back leg and the tail. Perfect little use of similar blue tones, right? So he still balanced it out, but it creates that visual interest in the fig. It's an amazing piece from Victor, and I love it. And it is a mastery of, uh, of, of an example of color application. Okay, so this is actually from uh, Tom, my co-host on Warhammer Weekly. And uh, this is his Forest Goblin army. And he's done an interesting thing here, and then again, this is a great example of split complementary color schemes because he's gone for the green and purple, our old Dr. Doom colors. But notice he's also worked in the pink magenta, right? So if we think back to our color wheel, we've got the purple and the sort of magenta there, very near each other. And then we drive all the way across to the other side of the wheel and we get the green of the goblins, right? And I think of it because of that, 
it's so much more interesting. It's this nice, perfect split complementary example. And when you look at the spider especially, I really love the way he did this. And, and let me go ahead and do this, because I want to show you something you're not even aware of. I want you to really look at the spider for a second and take a moment to think away about how he's balanced the color. All right, are you thinking about it? Okay, I'm gonna show you how he's balanced it. That's how he's balanced it. Remember what I said earlier with the model and the upwards and downwards triangle? That's what he's done here. What he's done with his fig is the same as what the designer did with that dress and that model in that first picture. He has a downward triangle of green all the goblins being wide, coming forward into the point, and then going down into the eyes of the uh, spider. The purple being much wider and out on the front legs, which are splayed, going up into the small amount of purple around the sort of shaman or whatever he is, is his little neck piece, and up to the big spider on the web. Right. So he's created these two inverse triangles of movement. What that means is that your eye as it's looking at it, constantly moves around the fig in a comfortable way. You have something drawing you down, and you have something drawing you up. It creates visual interest because your eye wants to look down at the detail, and then you get drawn back up to look at another detail. The last thing you ever want is one single instance of some bright color unbalanced because then your eye locks to it, and you can't look anywhere else. There's no part of this spider out of balance and your eye constantly moves comfortably around the figure. Okay. Most of this stuff, by the way, is subconscious. Like when you look at it, you don't, it, it's hard to consciously understand why you are or are not liking these things. But often it's stuff like this that is the reason that something is attractive and or repulsive to you. That's what's sort of creating these subconscious things. These are all very deeply ingrained. Okay. So here are two figs from my Zinch uh, Chaos Army. And the one on the left, the Cockatrice, was, is a fun challenge because there are three different really primary textures. You've got skin and wing leather and scale, and then you've got these feathers and fur. Um, this guy's just a riot of different textures. It's, it's rare to have a creature with so many different things. If you had some metal plates on him, I should really convert one with metal plates just so you're really just running the complete gamut. Of, uh, of every type of texture. Um, but what I want to point out to you that I did here is the same as what I mentioned before. So there's my color triangle of blue, right? And it still even connects down into the base. So I've kind of actually got two triangles coming together at his head, which, and that matches the triangle of the fig. If you look at this thing, he's sort of a big triangle sitting on top of another triangle. The top one being the wings coming down to the head, the bottom one being the body going out into the tail. It's two triangles pointing at each other, right? And the color is balanced with that assumption that the purple of the wings come down into the purple of like the tongue and then expand out again into the purple of the feet and the scales. And the blue of the feathers come down into the head and then go out into the base. Um, there's also some blue on like some fur on his back. We can't see it at this angle. And that's the thing, like it's tough to get your, it's tough to get it balanced sometimes at every single angle, just because, you know, figs are figs, they're not paintings or something. They're not two dimensional. Uh, on the right, what I want to point out is the challenge I faced with the guy on the right. So he is a monochromatic fig. That is to say he is done completely in one color. The only color on him is blue. Uh, one particular color blue. And then everything else is a shade and a tint. Right? All I did is take him down to black or up to white. And it was fun to paint because it was a real challenge to push myself to try to paint in that style. But as I was finishing him up and realized that I, needed, I wanted to make the hilt of his little sword gold, I realized I had a big problem on my hands. Because if I made the hilt of that sword gold, I was screwed. That was going to be the only point on that model that was that bright. And that's why I'm going to talk for a second about gold. I know I said I'm going to leave metallics out of this and stick to colors. But gold is a little different than the rest of the metallics, like steel. Steel is gray, and so tends to fade into the background, much in the same way as gray, you know, just flat matte gray does. Gold, however, is so bright and so ostentatious that it tends to draw the eye. And so when it came time to do this fig, I thought, oh man, I really need to balance this out somehow. Hence, 
the thing down in the ice, that little staff that I that I buried in the ice. And I did that to try to move your eye off of the end of his sword and down to keep you moving around the model. I'll leave you to decide whether or not I was successful. That's that's up to the that's up to the beholder. Uh, but I think that but that's certainly why I did it. <laughs> I don't know if it worked, but I know why I tried. Okay. Let's move on. So these are two more figs, um, and, and both of them are sort of examples of what we've talked about already. I'll draw your attention to my sorceress from my Bretonian on the, on the left. She actually has a quadratic color scheme, okay? Red, green, purple, blue. Um, which is, I think, as I said at the beginning, I would steer away from this most times. Um, I did go for that here. But there are ways that I tried to make sure that uh, it worked. Namely, like with her hair, there are a lot of purple tones mixed into the shades of that red. Um, and I didn't go for some bright, flaming, you know, crazy red hair. Like compare the color of her red, of her hair, to the red of, say, the, the knight's um, little horn flag on the right. Yeah, it's, it's much more subdued. And the reason for that is because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't drawing the, the eye. The brighter those colors are, the more it's going to prevent your eye from moving around. Green is another one that was very contrasting. And really what I wanted this to be was a split complementary with green, blue, and purple. Okay, So much like what uh, Tom did with his stuff, just with slightly different shades. And so, to do that, I needed to make sure that the green kept your eye moving throughout. And if you look, the gem at the top is green, the little wrap around is green, and then I put a lot of green on the base. You can use the base to create balance if you can't balance it on the fig. Once I did that little wrap around, I was out of space. So I ran the green and did a bunch of green down on the base, grasses and flowers and such, to keep your eye moving up and down the fig. If that green had just been, say, the gem up top, then the problem is it would be bright enough that it would draw your attention and you wouldn't really be able to look to the other places. You notice that I didn't take the tint of the red up as high. Again, to keep it from stopping your eye the blue and the purple have much more extreme tints, much more extreme highlights. The guy on the right, with the bright red being really the primary color, and really his only true color, what was important here was to keep that triangle in balance, right? And so when it came time to decide what to do his flag, and I looked at him, because the flag was actually one of the last things I painted, I looked and saw, okay, I've got these red sort of shield emblems on his barding, it needs to be red as well to create the right triangle and movement around the fig. Okay? All right, so what are our final thoughts? Two strong colors, three total colors. And by that I mean from a distance your fig should basically look two color. Um, we're not talking about neutrals, browns, grays, mostly whites. Um, we're talking about colors, the things that exist on the color wheel. And three total colors with the third color acting as a weak tertiary, if, if it exists at all, and being there only to balance the fig and to create visual interest. Uh, neutral tones that fade into the piece don't count. These are your brown leather belts and your gray, you know, sticks and stabs and whatever, doesn't matter. It's just, you know, you, you can, as long as you don't go crazy with it, it'll generally be fine and work with more or less anything. Anything bright has to be balanced, okay? The brighter, more ostentatious the color. Pinks, bright oranges, sky blues, yeah? All of these things need to be in balance on the miniature. They have to have sort of, that triangle has to be maintained. They have to be sort of, when I say a triangle, I mean just as you saw me draw multiple times, I have to create a triangle around the fig to keep the eye moving. It can't just be, oh, it exists in three places, hence it's fine. No, it needs to be spread out on the figure in balance. 
And related to that, then think about the direction the color is forcing the eye to move. As you as your eye moves and is caught by these bright colors as it looks around, how are you moving the eye of the person around the figure? Right? Or is there a place where it's stopped? It's just like you've got one standalone color, hence they've stopped moving. Um, if you can't balance on the figure, balance on the base. If you've got a little bit of pink or something, but it's only up at the top of the miniature and you need a lower point to that triangle, pink flowers your friend. Throw a bunch on the base, right? And you'll create that triangle. Finally, metal steel can generally go with anything, being primarily gray. It will, in general, just fade and, and look fine, but gold is much less forgiving. Gold itself needs to be in balance. And, you know, it, it can work, again, with most colors. If you think of gold, it looks good with red, purple, green, blue. Like, you know, for mo in most cases, gold will go with all the other colors. But it's so bright, it has to be in balance in the same way as your bright colors do. Okay? So there we go. That's hobby cheating. Another hobby cheating down on color theory. Uh, I promise next time we'll return to more paint tips and tricks. But hopefully this was all... Uh, informative and interesting and uh, I hope I gave you something to think about. Appreciate watching. Leave your comments below. As always, look forward to the conversation and we'll see you next time.